In the days following the death and potential murder of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, America's political leaders weighed in on who was responsible and what the next steps should be. Former President Trump weighed in on Truth Social, writing, quote, the sudden death of Alexei Navalny has made me more and more aware of what is happening in our country. It is a slow, steady progression with crooked, radical left politicians, prosecutors, and judges leading us down a path to destruction, open borders, rigged elections, and grossly unfair courtroom decisions are destroying America. We are a nation in decline, a failing nation. Trump's critics were quick to note that the former president neglected to mention Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, and the one many have accused of having Navalny killed. Trump's rival for the GOP nomination, Nikki Haley, responded to Trump, writing, quote, Donald Trump could have condemned Vladimir Putin for being a murderous thug, Trump could have praised Navalny's courage. Instead, he stole a page from liberal, Liberals' playbook denouncing America and comparing our country to Russia. The mainstream media seems to have a different villain in mind for who's responsible for Navalny's death. House Republicans, during a quick press gaggle outside of Marine One, CNN's J MJ Lee asked the president if he would, quote, say that Alexei Navalny's blood is on the hands of House Republicans right now, to which Biden said he wouldn't go that far, but encouraged the House to take up funding legislation for Ukraine and stop using anti-NATO rhetoric. Vice President Kamala Harris, speaking at a security conference in Munich, was quick to lay the blame for Navalny's death at Putin's feet. Here's Harris. We've all just received reports that Alexei Navalny has died in Russia. This is, of course, terrible news, which we are working to confirm. My prayers are with his family, including his wife, Yulia, who is with us today. And if confirmed, this would be a further sign of Putin's brutality. Whatever story they tell, let us be clear, Russia is responsible. And we will have more to say on this later. But not everyone saw Navalny as a scion for a new glorious mother, Russia. Our next guest conducted interviews with two Russian leftists who described Navalny as a representative of a different faction of the Russian elite who backs continued neoliberal policies in alliance with destabilizing NATO-backed actors. Here to discuss in, in, in Navalny and what his death means is host of the show Pushback on the Gray Zone, Aaron Mate. Thank you so much for being with us today. Good to be here. Now, I saw a lot of different takes going in different directions. I saw some leftists frustrated with Cornell West, for example, for um, offering uh, condolences that seem to uh, validate the politics of the man outside of just the value of an individual human life. So I wanted to get your take on who he was, and then we can get into maybe what the likelihood of him having been murdered by Putin actually was, what the evidence that is there, and so forth and so on. Well, I think the critique of Dr. Cornell West's uh, remembrance of Navalny stemmed from the fact that Cornell West sort of compared Navalny to people like Mamiya Abu Jamal, uh, which is not really a fair comparison when you have Navalny in his past espousing openly racist and xenophobic views. There was a time when he compared Muslim immigrants to uh, insects and called for them to be expelled. Now, his supporters will claim that since then he's undergone an evolution, but I actually didn't see much evidence for that. He was given opportunities to apologize, and he didn't take them. And the fact that he was celebrated in the West as this beacon of democracy st speaks to me uh, not so much as a celebration of his uh, values, although he was very courageous. He came back to Russia knowing he would face imprisonment, which was very brave, but because he collaborated with the West and he was useful to U.S. goals of destabilizing Russia and trying to install a new leader to replace Vladimir Putin. So Navalny's death, of course, is a tragedy. Uh, he was undoubtedly mistreated and uh, oppressed inside the Russian system. But we're seeing be him being held up as a hero because he served U.S. goals. He collaborated with Western institutions uh, and he was useful to the goal of regime changing Russia, which as we're seeing in the proxy war in Ukraine, is the U.S. goal. Well, sure. I mean, I would say that, you know, regime change through conflict with Russia is not something we want and is, you know, not a realistic goal. And I don't support any more funding for Ukraine for that reason. I mean, it's one thing to, you know, support regime change through kind of illicit CIA-type deals. I mean, in this case, to the extent it's supporting regime change, isn't it just supporting 
you know, someone who was who, who wanted the Russian system to be more democratic, wanted to use what remained of the democratic system within Russia to to oppose Putin. Someone who was who was poisoned. I, I it's it's very much I think established poisoned by Russian forces by Putin. Um, I, I tend not to doubt that he was killed on uh, on Vladimir Putin's orders. Um, is that not you know is that not worth? not from an interfering sort of in Russian standpoint, but in a, well, it would be better if Russia had an actual democracy and someone could run against Vladimir Putin. The people could decide something Putin himself has, you know, utterly prevented from happening in this country. And, and that's why it's a hero. He's a hero, not really for his specific politics or the things that he said, which I don't, you know, doubt your evaluation of them is accurate. Well, a few points. Uh, there's no doubt that Russia is autocratic, but note how we don't see people in Russia who oppose Putin, who come from the left or who are in the Communist Party or who are anti-war, they don't get nearly the same amount of coverage that Navalny does. We have to ask ourselves why, what's the key difference? The key difference is that Navalny collaborates with Western governments. He collaborated with a group called Bellingcat, which is funded by a series of Western governments and contractors that profit off of Western governments uh, foreign wars abroad. Uh, his, he founded a group, Democratic Alternative, that has received funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, which funds regime change efforts abroad. That, to me, is the key difference. There are plenty of dissidents inside Russia who don't get nearly the amount of attention that Navalny did. And I think that explains that simply like the reason why is because these groups aren't trying to collaborate with the West in the West's own goals of destabilizing Russia. In terms of all the things that happened to Navalny, you know, I do actually have some questions. Uh, the poisoning to me, the official story there never made any sense. We're supposed to believe that Russia tried to poison Navalny with Novichok. Somehow it didn't kill him, even though this is one of the most powerful nerve agents in the world. Russia then, after allegedly trying to kill him, then lets him leave rather than kills him as he's being, as he's receiving medical attention. He goes to Germany. After that, it's the CIA and British intelligence that immediately supply the German government with the purported evidence that proves Russia's involvement in his attempted murder, which raises questions for me. What is the CIA doing uh, tracking this so closely and how are they so sure that they have the proof? I mean, this is suspicious, especially when Navalny is meanwhile collaborating with Western funded groups, including Bellingcat, who he then works with to produce videos that uh, finger Russia in his attempted assassination. And then he goes back to Russia and gets imprisoned. And um, all this just raises questions to me. So no, I don't accept the official story. And I think certainly there has to be a, a credible international investigation of what happened here. I don't rule out the possibility that he was killed by the Russian government. Anything is possible. But I don't accept the U.S. government's assertion that this is the case just on faith. There needs to be credible independent investigations of this. And just as a last question here, you heard Donald Trump's response to this, which liberals pushed back again, saying that it doesn't point the finger or even raise any implication that it could have been uh, Russia or that Navalny was a victim of uh, 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 Russian uh, authoritarianism or an autocratic regime, as, as you described it. Oh, do, do you read that same implication into Trump's remarks? And, and what do you make of him basically saying it reminds me of, of how bad America is right now? What does one have to do with the other? Well, you know, Trump naturally made this about himself because he's a narcissist. So that wasn't surprising. But again, Trump is being held up right now as the villain in this whole disaster over the Ukraine proxy war because House Republicans are refusing to give Joe Biden, at least right now, another $61 billion to prolong this war. And so naturally, because Trump and Russia are blamed for everything in the US, which has been the playbook since 2016, the Biden administration is trying to somehow uh, make Trump the, the villain here too. And really, the Biden administration is the one that chose to abandon all diplomatic opportunities and chose to use, and chose to use Ukraine to bleed Russia, which remains the policy today. And now they're desperate for a $61 billion lifeline to prolong this war. So undoubtedly, they're gonna to try to use all the uh, villains they can, including Trump and Putin, and try to make Navalny now some sort of symbol for why the proxy war should continue. And one more point on this, just note there's a chorus of people inside the US across both political parties on cable TV, crying about Navalny's death and claiming they care about the right of uh, dissidents 
to stand up to uh, governments. Well, meanwhile, what is happening in the U.S.? It's as we're speaking, Julian Assange is facing uh, his last ditch effort to avoid extradition to the U.S., where he faces life in prison uh, for what? Revealing U.S. state crimes. There's also been zero words said about Gonzalo Lira, who was a U.S. citizen in prison inside Ukraine for criticizing the Ukrainian government. He recently passed away in Ukrainian custody. So none of these people who claim to care about the right of dissent and the right of people to speak out against illegitimate governments or, or, or uh, authoritarian governments have said a word about Julian Assange or Gonzalo Lira. And that speaks to a profound hypocrisy that needs to be called out. Mm. I think you're certainly right about the selective outrage when uh, when political prisoners are held, when free speech is not followed, when political opposition is uh, is treated in, in such a matter. Um, so the point should be, you know, not to disparage Navalny or, or say that there was, you know, which I'm not accusing you of doing, obviously, of saying that that was okay and should be ignored, but to also look to our own allies and our own government when they are engaged in political repression. Um, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here. Thanks for having me.